second point, how do we harmonize this issue of growth in international trade with port growth and the underlying rail and highway systems? So the Obama administration put forth a, an initiative to double exports by the year 2015. So I got all these port directors from all over the United States, so I want everybody to raise their hand who received a call, not from President Obama, but maybe somebody in their transportation department, and asked you, can you all handle doubling exports in our country? How many, how many hands? One hand. That's good. Okay. So um, let's raise them again. If, if you're going to double your exports by the year 2015, can I see a show of hands of who could actually handle that? There's one in every group. My, my point in all this is if we're going to have a national economic plan of growth for this country, we've got to have a vision for our supply chain as how, how that's going to handle that. And I would tell you that we don't. Now, make no mistake, up until now, we, we've kind of gotten along with this. We've done a, really a, a very good job of being able to handle this. We've responded to the marketplace as a whole. The market makes independent judgments on how freight will flow. When one segment of the chain fills up, resulting in chronic congestion, the market prices the demand off that network to a competitor. And this has implications for every part of our supply chain, ships, ports, highways, rail lines, terminals, labor, warehouses. So let's look at a couple of, the, of best practices or great examples of how we've harmonized economic and this port growth. And since we're in the state of Washington, I want to start with the Washington FAST program. FAST um, is a partnership of 26 local cities, counties, ports, federal, state, regional transportation agencies, railroads, trucking interests, all intent on solving freight mobility problems with coordinated solutions. Most of the projects, uh, quite frankly, have been grade separations to enhance the flow of freight in and around the ports. What's somewhat, though, unique, though, is the strength of the partnership. They've shared information and funding resources, sometimes shifting funds from projects that were delayed to those that were ready to begin to benefit, again, the program as a whole. Because of this team approach, projects were built that would have otherwise not have been built. Since 1998, partners have identified and assembled $568 million of public and private funding. The FAST corridor has funded in construction more than 13 projects, many of them grade separations. Second best, best pra uh, practice, Alameda Corridor. 20-mile-long rail expressway that links the ports of LA and Long Beach to the transcontinental main, main lines of the rail yards near downtown Los Angeles. The cost was $2.4 billion. It improved the flow of cargo in and out of the ports while minimizing the effect of freight movements on local communities. I was there a couple weeks ago and I was in a helicopter and we flew up and down the corridor and you know I remember the consternation of the local communities and uh, Dick Stanky and his counterparts in the Port of LA did a great job of, of explaining to people how much better this was going to be for them. And I, I think we took out 200 grade crossings with overpasses and underpasses. It's just a much better way of life for everybody who lives up and down that corridor. And yet for the ports, it's allowed the ports to continue to grow. It provide, com provided commerce, jobs, all those various things. This project would not have happened without the cooperation and funding from both pu public and private stakeholders. Bonds, USDOT, ports, railroads, LA County, MTA, state, federal groups, and the public through user fees. I was telling somebody earlier, you know, we're, we're always grappling with, you know, our customers, who many of them are in this room today, they know at the end of the day they're going to pay for this infrastructure. What drives them crazy is that when, when we collectively go to them with a project and they can't be assured that the money's actually going to stay on the project. And so when we talked about spending this kind of money in Alameda on the corridor, $2.4 billion, it was very, very much up front. We we're going to tell the customers, you're going to pay for it. It's going to be, I think we started with 16 bucks a TEU. And because we had a great governance around that project and everybody 
we, we did so many tours, we were bringing all these customers in to show them the corridor, and they were able to see $2.4 billion, corridor, $18 or $16, I'm, I'm paying for this. But, you know, it didn't go off project. It didn't go off to solve world hunger. World hunger is very important to be solved, but not with the $16 a TEU or $18 a TEU. And so, so customers accepted it. So let's take a look at a best practice that's, that's not in this country that's working very well someplace else. It's the Canadian Trade Emphasis, Asia Pacific Gateway and Corridors Initiatives. Uh, for short, it's called the Pacific Gateway Strategy. Coordination and collaboration between a broad base of stakeholders, federal, providential, local governments, port authorities, railways, and labor, all in the process with a goal of bringing more trade, more trade, more trade, trucks, containers, railroads to Canada. So literally, the federal government, the British Columbia, they all get together and they figure out tax strategies and incentives to bring more trade to their country. It's, it's kind of mind-boggling if, if you're in my chair because we're always fighting with each other and, you know, I've never seen our federal government help us on how to attract more trade and if I did then we'd be fighting with the local communities. But, but that's what Canada is Canada's doing. And, and, and here's the other, I think, really distinguishing deal. They're taking a corridor approach to this. You know, they're, they're looking all the way out from Port of Vancouver or Prince Rupert all the way out to Montreal. And they're looking at where the bottlenecks are, how to clear up those bottlenecks, again, to facilitate this trade of goods. Because, they again, they have recognized that the lower the cost of their supply chain as a percent of their GDP, the more money that they'll have to be able to use, the more jobs they'll be able to have to compete around the world globally. Both the federal and the governments, local governments have stepped up with funding dedicated to increasing trade and implementing policies to remove barriers to expansion. Over $3.5 billion have been, uh, projects have been announced, including federal contributions, federal contributions of over $1.4 billion. Again, the biggest difference between what I see in Canada and what I see here is they have a real desire to grow trade. And I think they're, they're going to find that they have a lot of success to do that. In our country, we've been guilty of wanting the benefits of trade, right? The lower cost of product delivery, but the burden of trade has fallen on the local communities. And once that occurs, the loudest voice takes over and it turns into a no growth agenda. And I think that that's where we are in, in many of the communities. What happens when you, do, when you do this, of course, you lose that headroom that allows the American worker to be more productive and, and compete more globally uh, all over the world. You know, if you think about we have jobs concerns today and it's hard to watch the news or anything, pick up a paper and it's all about jobs, jobs, jobs. Think about what happens when our supply chain costs as a percent of our GDP goes to 9% to 10% to 12%. What it does, it restricts our ability to be competitive. And so providing the most efficient infrastructure and transportation is going to be so important. If that were to happen, the supply chain, though, will find a way to fill itself. It'll scamper around. It, it may use the all-water route. It may go to Mexico, it may go to Canada, but in all cases, it's a less efficient route. And bottom line again, the U.S. worker will become less competitive.